Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith in keeping with what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. For we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Saviour, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace through death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there over our sin no more have dominion for more than conquerors we are turn your eyes upon Jesus look full wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory
glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful
Here. Can I you hear will my... never leave you or forsake you. Anyway, it's just it's great to be with you this morning. Now, our theme you probably have uh, gathered from the title at the front of the program is between a rock and a hard place, um, which I think is quite an apt title uh, considering the season that we're in at the moment. Um, but we've been encouraged this morning by the Word of God in 2 Corinthians 4. James Hope Gill finished it off very nicely saying, so we don't fix our eyes on what we can see, but what we can't see. We exactly. fix our eyes on Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. That's what it is. We're going to hand over to John O'Brien who's going to tell our kids story. story. Oh, you got a word in edgeways there, didn't you? <laughs> Finally. <laughs> And they're off. Not so much a race, actually, but dragging their heels on another hot day through the wilderness. The people just didn't see the signs. God in front of them as a cloud on a hot day with blue sky and scorching sun. The cloud would have been great shade and it also moved so they could follow it. God was always leading, and at night, when the temperature dropped and the sun had disappeared, the pillar of fire kept them warm, and it also guided their feet. It was like a lamp before them, so they travelled through the darkness. They knew where to go. As you know, the people were very good at something extremely bad. Moses, did you bring us out into the wilderness so we could die? Back in Egypt, our bread baskets were stuffed every morning and every evening our bowls with meat. And of course, God provided for them amazing miracles. Manna in the day that fell, bread. And in the evening, God gave them meat to eat. They just didn't see the signs. And now, as they camped in the wilderness, there was no water. And it started again. The people were very angry. They came up to Moses. Oh, thanks, Moses. Did you bring us out into the wilderness so all our children and all our cattle would die of thirst. We need something to drink. What are you going to do about it? Day after day, they complained, and they moaned, and they grumbled, and they quarrelled. In fact, 
it became so serious that Moses took himself off and he threw himself down again in that familiar position on his knees, face down before his God. Oh God, cried Moses, can you hear the people again? They continue to moan. They continue to grumble. They can't see the signs. They're just not trusting you. And God, they're about to stone me. Will you provide again? Moses, I will go before you again. Stand up. Take some leaders with you that you can trust. And your staff. The same one that you took to the River Nile that I use to perform miracles. Go to the huge rocks at Horeb and I will show you what to do. So Moses obeyed and off he went. The entire nation of Israel watched. Moses, take your staff and hit the rock. Moses raised his staff and slammed it down on the rock. At first, nothing seemed to happen. And then, almost like a little mini earthquake underground, a rumble, some of the smaller stones began to shake and wobble across the desert floor. And there was gurgling and bursting and froth and foam. And then, water flowed out of the rock, continuously, fresh, living water. Now the people were happy. Now the people, for a while anyway, stopped complaining. They had so much fresh water to drink. All their animals and their children had plenty. But they didn't see the signs. Always in the Old Testament, when God spoke, he was always pointing towards his son, who would be revealed in the New Testament. Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are thirsty, and I will give you living water to drink. And often, Jesus referred himself like a rock, somebody who was always there, strong, dependable, reliable, And we can build our lives on that rock. The signs and the provision are always there. I know in these days it's very different and it can be very difficult. And we can moan and grumble and quarrel and complain. But let's change it. Let's turn all this into praise and into thanks. Let's worship our God. Let's see his provision. Let's feel his presence. And let's trust him. Even if we think we're going through our wilderness, God will never leave us. God is always for us. Let's worship and praise him today. Sorry for the racket in the first link. Not me. So, you nearly said it. <laughs> I, knew, I knew as soon as the words came out of my mouth exactly what you were going to say. No, the washing machine was in the background. I've turned it off now. I know my work is never done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever. We're going to hand over to a, a lovely group of people now who are going to give us some encouragement during lockdown. And boy, do we need them. And boy, do we need them. In the summer, I was given a little plant by the son of a good friend who'd unexpectedly died. It was from her garden, and when I brought it home, it only had a few leaves. But I put it on the windowsill in the light, and kept it watered, and at Christmas, it flowered. Seeming almost to me in memory of our 50-year friendship. The morning after Pam died, in May, I received a card from a friend at MCF who posted it 
actually the previous day, and written, Thinking of you today and sending lots of love. That friend knew nothing of Pam and my sadness, so I believe the message was prompted by God, for the timing was perfect. God knew I needed comfort that morning. When we are crying, he hears us. Psalm 116 verse 1 in the Living Bible Translation says, I love the Lord because he hears my prayers and answers them. He bends down and listens. During lockdown, I have thanked God for my friendships. Just a little testimony about how God has helped me during lockdown last year. Uh, although I work with CLC along with my husband Neil and have done for 28 years, I've always had a deep desire to help families, especially vulnerable families with young children. Many years ago I trained as a children's nurse in London and thought that that would be my lifetime career. That hasn't worked out. I'm perfectly happy with what God has called me to do and I'm very grateful to God that he's given me an opportunity all along, even for the 11 years we lived in Spain, to have something to do with children on a voluntary basis. When lockdown came, the things that I would, was doing, which was supporting a couple of families that I'd met through Homestart, um, plus another couple of families that I know, and volunteering a little bit at a local primary school, and all of that stopped. I also was suffering because we don't see our grandchildren very often, they live in Australia. But at the beginning of the year, before we even knew about Covid, I had planned to go to Australia for a month for the birth of our second grandson out there and I had a wonderful time and got back just in time for lockdown. Um, I could have been stuck out there which wouldn't have bothered me too much but um, it was just lovely that I had that chance at the beginning of the year. Don't know when we'll get to see them again. Then um, when the bubbles were allowed, support bubbles, I was able to um, form a bubble along with my husband with a single mum with two little boys that I'd become very good friends with through Homestart, a charity I used to volunteer with. She lives local to me and quite honestly we've become like surrogate grandparents for her little boys. She's actually younger than two of my sons so um, it's been a really lovely experience to get to know her better um, and yeah, feel like we're almost family as well as friends and we're doing something useful for her and her friendship has meant a lot to me. And then finally, just before Christmas, uh, Safe Families for Children, which is a Christian charity which has been in England a few years now. I've been praying for ages, some of you know, um, that Safe Families would start working in Sheffield and it was a supposed to, got delayed, finally started in December and just before Christmas I was allocated a local family um, that I could support and help and befriend. That's only done by phone, by text messages at the moment, but already I am thoroughly appreciating that opportunity and very grateful to God. He knows my needs. I'm happy working with CLC, but he makes sure that I can still have contact with children and befriend families that need a friend. Praise the Lord. Hello church family whom I miss with all my heart. I just wanted to take a minute to share something that God has been working on in my life since lockdowns. It may seem a very small thing but I feel really challenged in the area of control and of not having any control over my day-to-day -day life or just over the next few weeks or even the next few months. I just feel um, initially in lockdown I just found that a really strange thing and it was a really um, good crash course in learning how to fully depend on God and to lean into him and so I've been really challenged um, by that very simple verse in, in 1 Peter 5 7 which says cast your cares on him for he cares for you or cast your burdens on him because he cares for you um, it seems such a simple verse but in practice it's been really challenging to do and I've just really been praying that God would be at work in that area of my life and helping me to lay things at his feet um, and to recognise the things that I have no control over and to be able to just lean into him more and more. And so although it's a really challenging time, I'm really grateful for the ways in which God is growing me and that is one area and I just really wanted to praise him for that 
and pray that over you, those of you that are struggling to lay things at his feet. I just wanted to pray for you all and pray that you would also remember that verse and cling to it. Thank you. Bye. He has done so much for me. I cannot tell it all. The end part of the song means that accept my praise lord and among all the testimonies that we have my number one is to thank god for the gift of life because if i am not alive this morning i wouldn't be giving this testimony and it does not mean that i or the rest of us are better than anybody else or we deserve to be alive today but we thank god for preserving us we thank god for the gift of life we thank God because we believe that it's his way of telling us that he still have a use for us in this world. And my prayer is God will preserve all of us for his glory in Jesus name. So my testimony is to thank God for the gift of life and also to thank God for our beautiful church family. Everybody has been amazing and, you know, prayerful and very supportive. God bless you all. Thank you. I'm grateful for um from for seeing my grandma and granddad and my cousins when it was over lockdown. Thank you, our people, for all that encouragement. encouragement. Really, yeah. really good. Thank you very much. Now, uh, many of you will have seen the tribute uh, service that we did for Ray Booth and it was a really great service with so many contributions from people from all over the yes. world and a big part of that was an offering that was held over the course of the week for uh, a number of different <coughs> areas, I'm just choking on something, <coughs> a number of different areas that were um, explained at the time and uh, we just want to tell you that uh, the amount raised amazing. over the course of that week was an amazing four thousand nine hundred and thirty-seven pounds and fifty uh, pence. Amazing. amazing, wonderful! Thank you so much for it's, your generosity. Yes, not Incredible. surprised at the generosity mm. and uh, not surprised at all at the honour shown to Ray. But it yes. is good just to mm. see in tangible reality uh, how oh, much uh, Ray's life has meant to so many to people, so many people. Mm. and uh, what a tribute mm. to him 4937 amazing pounds, 50 pence well done great thank you so yep. much it's time for our ordinary offering now <laughs> ordinary it's only an ordinary offering no. but uh, no it's time for an offering and uh, this is going to be for our regular um, church offering and uh, the details are coming up now
Thank you very much. What a great song uh, that one is. Thank you very much to Martin Chalk and the team. Now, before we hand over to Jonathan, just a couple of announcements. Um, just to say that the WhatsApp prayer meeting is on this evening, Sunday evening at 7.30. If you want to be connected to that, then the email is at the bottom as well. as or the if top. You, or the top. Yeah, sometimes I say at the bottom and it's at the top. Of, but anyway, depends where it fits. Um, and also to say that there is Zoom after the church mm-hmm. service mm-hmm. this morning. If you uh, want to connect, to that again go to that email address and we'll make sure but not if you're watching on catch up not if you're watching on catch up no it won't work we won't be there because you may still be charged and we might be doing something else we might be busy so um there's that right um Right, before we hand over to Jonathan, just to let you know that Olivia starts her adventure. Remember, she shared with us last week, but she starts her adventure this evening, Sunday evening, she starts on her journey. Now, we're going to pray for Olivia now, but also we want to just send big hugs to Heather and Dylan and the family. Really big 
squeezy hugs because we know that whilst for Olivia she will be heading off on a new adventure and all the excitement and I'm sure trepidation for those staying behind at home it it just makes I mean I get upset when the boys travel down the road I don't um so we we're thinking about you Heather and Dylan particularly Heather big big hugs anyway we're going to pray for Olivia as she starts on this next journey Father, we want to thank you for Olivia. We want to thank you for her heart to serve you. We want to thank you for her determination to do whatever it is that you ask of her to do, whatever you've called her to. Father, even though I'm sure at times she's felt apprehensive and uncertain, she's been determined to rise above it and to walk the journey you've called her to walk. And we want to say thank you for her, Father. And we pray you bless her. We pray as she uh, she goes about this journey, as she goes to the airport, with all that's going on at the moment with COVID and everything else, we just pray that you would walk her through this whole process seamlessly, that the journey would be safe. Father, watch over that plane. Thank you that you're the pilot of that journey. We pray that you'd watch over her, help her to settle well. I pray she'd find Christian friends uh, where she's going. And Father, we just place her in your hands and say that we trust you that you will watch over her and guard her and keep her and father we look forward to when she comes back with all the news of Mm. all that you've done through her life we do pray particularly for heather and for dylan and for the family as they say goodbye and i know that there'll be all all the uncertainty that that is but i just pray the god of all comfort that you would be their peace in this uh particular season that you would guard their hearts and their minds and their imaginations that they would determine to keep them set on you we pray your blessing upon them now in jesus name amen amen Amen. jonathan it's over to you hi there the book of exodus tells us this great story of a people on a journey They were dealing with very new and unexpected challenges and circumstances. They were going somewhere they'd never been before, but they were traveling in hope of claiming God's promise for them, a home, um, getting home to that promised land. And time and again, as we read this story, we read of God's great intervention on their behalf. From the time that Moses first reappeared back in Egypt as God's messenger until the very time they arrive at the promised land itself. We see a story of God's interaction with his people and his intervention on their behalf. A God who protects, who guides, who delivers, who provides. And boy, were the people so grateful. I mean, imagine it. You've just witnessed extraordinary things from plagues in Egypt to crossing a Red Sea and seeing an Egyptian army destroyed, a deliverance from Pharaoh, the mighty power of the day, a deliverance from slavery. You've had your food provided. You've got the constant reminder of God's presence with you in those columns of fire and cloud. God is there day and night and God himself is guiding you on this journey. We long to see miracles in our day, don't we? And we celebrate those healings and things that we we see and know of God at work. But these were real signs and wonders on a daily basis among the people. And yet, they moaned, they grumbled, they complained, and they even wished for the good old days of slavery. You know, making bricks without straw, having our firstborn killed. Oh, they were great days. Wish we could go back there. They'd actually lost perspective. They'd taken God for granted. I think sometimes we believe that, you know, if only there were such outstanding miracles in our day, then surely there would be a revival of people coming to faith. Surely people would believe. Do you know, I'm not so sure. Because over the years I've been here in Sheffield, I've prayed with loads of people in our area for healing, some of whom have definitely been healed. I've been from house to house, uh, getting rid of poltergeists and other such stuff in the, ha- in the house, doing the Ghostbuster stuff. And do you know, people have been very grateful. Things have happened. But despite God's healing and God's deliverance, people haven't you know, fallen to their knees and said, what must I do to be saved? Others have shown some enthusiasm for a short period of time, but soon get distracted by other stuff. And I guess I'm, I think that as human beings, you know, we can be very ungrateful. 
I think Jesus highlighted that with the healing of those lepers, didn't he? Where nine just went on their merry way and didn't bother to come back and say thank you. Now, Neil Wilson has recently encouraged us all to think of reasons to be grateful or thankful to God. And I think it's very important because we need to be intentional about this. Because honestly, I don't think it comes that naturally to us as human beings. Our default position is to moan. Our default position is to think, well, things could be better. Um, The message has a translation of Psalm 100 verse 4. and, and, And the translation says this, enter God's presence with the password, thank you. How often do we give thanks to God, thanksgiving? Being thankful for small mercies, as my parents used to say, but it is an antidote to our complaints and the bias that we have so often to find the the dark things or the, the things that are going wrong rather than think about the good things that are happening. Okay, you say, well, they had a real excuse to be, to be argumentative or to, to be, to be uh, cross at that time. They're thirsty. There's not enough water for them or their livestock. They seem to have been guided into an area that's arid, that doesn't have a, an adequate water supply. And they know without water, they're going to die. They're hot. They're desperate for a drink. And they're fearful about the future because they know potentially they could, they could die out here. And out of all this, of course, the blame game starts. The grumbles grow. I think of myself, you know, when I'm under pressure, when I'm stressed, when my physical or emotional needs are not being met and I'm, I'm feeling the pressure build on my life, what's inside me often comes to the surface. And it's not always pleasant. It's not always good reactions. But these people took it out on Moses. In a sense, in doing so, they were really taking it out on God. Now, I have to say, as a church leader for many, many years, I know it's an occupational hazard of church leadership that you always get things wrong. And we do at times. Um, and people are pretty quick to point it out, far more quick, honestly, than they are to say thank you. Um, but Moses is here under real attack of such a verbally aggressive type that he actually thinks his life's in danger. I think they might want to stone me. They want me dead. The man who'd done so much for them was now the subject of their anger. And Moses, we read, cried out to God. Well, I bet he did. He'd no one else to turn to. Remind me that old phrase, our extremity becomes God's opportunity. Help, he says, God, this is a life-threatening situation. What am I going to do with these people? Now, the sin that has been um, apparent here among the people was, was not their need for a solution or an answer to their prayers or a miracle, because it was a real problem. But their problem was their attitude to the problem they faced and their lack of trust in the God who had proved his care for them time and time again. I guess we all know it. When we, we just get obsessed or, or with a problem or an issue in our lives or in our family, and the immediacy and the intensity of the, the, the pressure of the situation we find ourselves in really affects us. It affects our sense of well-being. It affects our responses to other people around us. It affects our faith in God. It affects us physically as well. But we're missing the big picture. And it's the big picture that brings perspective. The truth was that God hadn't let the people down until, uh, uh, at all up to this point. And how could they really believe that the God who delivered them with such mighty acts from slavery and from the hand of Pharaoh would bring them into the middle of nowhere and allow them to die of thirst. It made absolutely no sense. The God who's led us so far as a church is not going to leave us halfway through what his purpose and plan is for our lives. Moses cries out to God and God tells him what to do. God, in a sense, takes control. He tells him to walk out of the camp with some of the elders and go to the rock at Horeb. And Moses is to strike the rock, very specific instruction, with his staff, and that streams of water would flow from it. I think it's interesting to think about the fact that Moses is told only to take a few other witnesses to this miracle with him. 
And it's as if the people miss out on God's power at work, another mighty dramatic act of God at work, because of their attitude. And this water gushed down. Now, you know, you often see pictures of this and, and it's like a little stream coming out of a rock. But you imagine there are a huge amount of people, huge amount of cattle. This had to be a powerful flow of water. It's almost more like a dam breaking. And I can imagine, you know, they may have been laughing about it at the time. Moses and the elders get absolutely drenched as this water gushes out. The place is given two names as a reminder to the Israelites and perhaps to us today of what God had done there. We have to have ways of remembering that God meets us um, at, at times in our lives. And I think that's because our memories in terms of faith and blessing of God are often so short lived. And when we face the next problem, we forget how God had met us in times past and how God has provided for us in times past because we're so obsessed with the situation we face now. The place has given two names, Meribah, which means it's a place where there was argument or quarrels or strife. And Massa, which means it was a place of testing. See, the people in their desperation, unlike Moses, hadn't cried out to God for an answer, hadn't cried help, help to God. They just picked a fight. Um, and, you know, basically they'd expected Moses to take, take the cop, take the blame for it all. They'd also tested God, as Moses said. Look, they're saying, if God really cares about us, he wouldn't let this happen to us. If God is real and alive and active, then he'd prove it to us by actually supplying our needs. If you're real, God, prove it by changing the circumstances we're in. You know, when things go wrong in our lives, even today, it's so easy to ask, well, where is God? Why did God allow that to happen? If God really loved me, why would he allow that to happen in my life? There is a flip side to this testing that the people were doing of God. And that is that God allows situations to come into our lives to test us. These very circumstances that we face test our faith. They test our obedience. They test our patience and endurance in the difficulties that we face. Do we still have our hope in God in the midst of struggles which are beyond us? So the story, I think, really rings true for us today. This past year has surely been a trial and test for so many people. We're on a journey through this pandemic and through lockdown. And for some of us, we're not really sure what lies beyond it. But in looking over the past year, that's been so difficult for so many of us. Yet the big picture is there's God's people. We've seen God's help and grace in so many ways. We've seen many answered prayers We've seen God providing in so many different ways. And I know we're challenged because so often God hasn't answered our prayers within our time frames and at our convenience or in the way we'd hope and expected. But God is among us. He's our rock in a hard place. His life-giving spirit still flows out to us and brings life. And in the midst of the challenges we face, I can't do this for you and you can't do this for me, but we must learn to trust God. We must learn to exercise our faith. I've got to learn this lesson as much as you have. We've got to stop complaining, blaming others, wishing it was different. To adopt what some people have called an attitude of gratitude and to find, as Neil has been telling us, Neil Wilson, find those 10,000 reasons (laughs) <laughs> to bless the Lord, O oh my soul. See, I truly believe God will meet us in our desperation and personal struggle because he does care for us. And he's the one who still guides us, who still protects us, who still provides for his people. Not just around the world, as we've seen answers to prayer in these missions that we support, but also here in the UK, here in Sheffield, here in Batemore, John Thorpe, Low Edges, Green Hill, Norton, wherever you live. His plan and purposes are still that much more bigger than our own personal needs, though. And sometimes we have to see or try to see the big picture. 
I want to close with a verse uh, in Psalm 95, verse 8. The psalmist says, Today, if you will hear God's voice, don't harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did at Massa in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me, though they had seen all that I'd done. Let's remember the blessings that God has given us and give thanks and trust him for our future. He's not brought us into the desert to die. He's brought us to lead us into a place of promise. Amen. Thank you for that, Jonathan. He didn't take us out to bring us... didn't bring us out this far to take us back again, no. He brought us out to take us into the promised land. Good. Do what it needs. It needs a saxophone. A saxophone. Graham, we're waiting for you. <laughs> but we <laughs> thank you, Jonathan. It's very true, isn't it? He didn't take us out this far to take us back. I often encourage myself with those words. He hasn't brought us this far. He hasn't brought us this far to, to leave take, us now. To leave us now. No, he hasn't. No, he hasn't. One of the things that Jonathan mentioned there was the 10,000 reasons that Neil had talked about before. And the deadline actually is today, but I'm going to extend it to Wednesday. But we'd love your your thanksgiving, your words that just highlight to you what God has done. We talked last week about um, the different things that people had mentioned. Somebody mentioned today that just so grateful to God for walking boots. I don't know what those walking boots have done, but for that person, they're very grateful that that they've had the opportunity to use those walking boots this year. So whatever it is, it might not mean anything to anybody, but it means something to you. Please send those in um, because I'd love to create something along Neil's um, idea of 10,000 reasons. So your deadline is Wednesday. He didn't take us back. We hang on to that. We hang on to that in this season. We're going to play out our last song. I'm really sorry if uh, you're bored of this song. I can't imagine that you possibly are. But we played it twice last week. We played it again on the live service and we're playing it again today. You've been good to us. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. See you next week. Bye. Bye.
Your goodness is running out. 